Morning, City Church. How's everybody doing out there? You know, it's, uh, let me get this straightened up here a little bit. Uh, you notice that uh, this week I'm actually experimenting with a little bit smaller computer. Last time I preached, the one I had up here was almost as big as this. So I'm going to try and see how this works. Uh, I'm not used to carrying a microphone, so if I get it away from my face, yell at me, get my attention, I'll get it back up there. But, uh, you know, when Daniel preached last week, he talked about a lot of things. And during the week, God put a word in my heart. Crazy. Crazy. Not sure where that came from, but it was just crazy. And it, it just kept speaking in my heart. And I, I started digging and looking and studying and praying. And we have a crazy God. You know, the song that we just sang, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I like to put crazy in there because it's, it's crazy. We don't understand why this God loves us the way he does, why he's willing to sacrifice what he sacrificed for us. It's crazy. I want to do a little bit of a survey today. I'm going to ask the guy, how many of you guys rocked Valentine's Day this week? Let me hear it. Oh, man, you guys... Okay, ladies, did they do good at least? Did all right? Okay, good. At least did good. Uh, you know, I, uh, my wife left Thursday morning to go up to her mother, so I didn't do anything for Thanksgiving. I, I got off pretty easy, but I think I'm going to make up for it this week. So, Daniel, I join you in that. There you go. That sounds like a winning. You know, like, like I said, last, day, uh, last Sunday, Daniel talked about the vision for City Church here in Pooler throughout 2019. And, he spoke about a lot of things that God has put on his heart and on the heart of the leadership in the church and the people that do the children's ministry and, and the kids' ministry and the student ministry. And some of the things that he talked about sound pretty simple, pretty reasonable, probably easy to be done. But then he talked about we're going to expand at minimum 3,000 feet from where we are now, 3,000 feet. Yeah, it didn't sound real bad. It, it, it is possible. But then he reemphasized the point that we're going to do this without going into debt. We don't go into debt in this church. And when God puts a, puts a plan in our heart, it's leaning into God and trusting that he's going to provide. We're going to build 3,000 feet under this church and not go into debt. Sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? Not judging, Daniel, I promise, <laughs> brother. The question I have for you is, have you ever, have you ever felt God asking you to do something, but it just didn't make sense? Maybe you got that little elbow nudge in the ribs from the Holy Spirit, and, but it seemed impossible. Or, or at minimum, it was going to be really difficult. And, and instead of trusting in God, you gave in to that. And you didn't do what the, the Spirit was prompting you to do. You know, I feel that all, all too often that, that, that we as Christians allow the Holy Spirit, we don't allow him to guide us like we should. We don't allow him to take us places where we're not comfortable. And, and, and I think he prompts us all the time. And he prompts us in many ways and in and throughout our life, and sometimes we hesitate. Sometimes we don't respond to that nudging. Now, I remember a time a few years ago when I was on the fire department, and we were discussing some thing there, and, and one of the firefighters asked me, he said, Captain, he said, why do you look at life so differently? Why are you so different? You know, and right then and there, it was like bells were going off in my head, you know, and, and the Holy Spirit saying, all right, Kevin, this is your chance. This is your opportunity. He doesn't really speak like that in my voice, but, but he was saying, you know, he was proud to me, and he's saying, this is your opportunity to tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. Tell them about how he's affected your life, how he has affected your outlook on life. 
So I looked at my firefighter and I opened my mouth and these words of wisdom came out. I said, well, it just doesn't do any good to get mad and get upset about it. And boom, drop the mic, we're done. And I left it right there. I blew it. I had an opportunity to listen to the nudging of the Holy Spirit. And I failed. I wasn't obedient. You know, there are thousands and thousands of days, and we won't talk about how many, that have gone by in my life. And the majority of them, I can't tell you a single thing that happened on most of those days. Remember nothing about them, but I guarantee you that this one day, this one day, I will never forget. I will never forget. I had an opportunity and I failed. But I want you to, I want you to know that God calls us to do things. Sometimes they're obvious. Sometimes they seem crazy. They don't make sense. And I couldn't really figure out why I didn't respond that day. You know, I mean, it wasn't like he was asking me to give him all my money, which wouldn't have really helped him much at the time, but you know, he wasn't asking me to give that up. He, he wasn't asking me to pull out the Bible and, and, and preach a sermon at the firehouse that day. He just simply asked me to share what I knew about the love of God and the sacrifice of Christ and how it affected my life. Why didn't I respond? I can tell you. I'm not proud of it. I didn't want to be embarrassed. I didn't want to be embarrassed. I was afraid of the reaction that I would get from these firefighters. I'm a captain. We're tough. We kick down doors, and put out the flames, and go home. You know, I was afraid that these people that I work with every day would look at me and think that, man, he's a little crazy. A little crazy. And for goodness sakes, I, I certainly didn't want to appear to be crazy. You know, I'm not really a gambling man, but I'd be willing to bet that any one of you, if you thought hard enough, and maybe some of you not hard at all, that you could think of a time or two or a situation that you were in where you felt that nudging. You felt God asking you to do something, and it just didn't make sense. So often we don't do what God wants because it just doesn't. It's crazy. We don't feel we can do it. We don't understand what it is he's trying to tell us to do. It, it makes us a little uncomfortable, takes us out of our comfort zone, asks us to do things that we think are beyond us. I think that's part of the reason, a very big part of the reason why we don't respond because we don't trust in the Spirit. We don't trust in God. We're going to look today in the uh, book of 2 Kings, in chapter 3, and I'm the kind of person when I do my studies and, and when I prepare for a message, I like to have about four or five different translations or versions of the Bible laid out in front of me. And I, and, and I think that's good. I mean, there are some that, that, that have a few words that one might not, and there are some that might not have the words that this one does, but they all lead to the same point. They all lead to the truth. If it doesn't, get rid of the Bible. That one doesn't work. But all these translations I had in front of me, they, they were all in agreement, but one just spoke a little bit more to me than the others, and that was the New King James as I was going through it. So as I read, I'll be reading from New King James. You know, sometimes, sometimes God's plan isn't what we think it should be. We think it should go a certain way. We think that we should do a certain thing, and sometimes God has a different plan. And what I hope we see today is that through God's plan, in His plan, first of all, it requires our response. When he prompts us to do something, 
it requires us to respond in some way. When God presents his plan to us, it tests our trust in him. It tests our faith. How willing are we to do and go that way? And it exceeds our expectations. And that's the amazing part. If we're faithful, if we're obedient, God will constantly exceed our expectations. So 2 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 5. And again, I'm reading from the New King James. It says, But it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at the time and mustered all Israel. And then he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying to the king, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go fight against Moab with me? And he said, I will go. I will go up. I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses as your horses. And then he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, by way of the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on that roundabout route seven days. And there was no water for the army, nor the animals that followed him. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver us into the hands of Moab. I'm going to stop there for just a minute, kind of expound upon what, what was going on at this time that got them to this point. You see, Ahab had died. He was the king of Israel. And Jehoram, his son, became the king. Now, Joram, Jehoram wasn't a really great king. He wasn't as bad as Ahab, but he still sinned before God. Amasha, the king of Moab, had, had, had paid exorbitant taxes to Ahab for many, many years, and, and, and the scripture tells us that it was 100,000 lambs a year, 100,000 skins from the rams, their wool. It's a lot of animals. But Mesha decided that he wasn't going to do that anymore, and he rebelled against Jehoram. So these three, thing, three kings got together, and, and, and they combined their armies, and they started off on this, this journey. And they traveled for seven days. And the word that he uses, it talks about roundabout. And the word that they used in there also is translated as meandering or winding or indirect. So they were wandering through the wilderness trying to get to this place where they would fight the king of Moab. And they ran out of water. Whoops. Somebody didn't plan that out very well. They ran out of water. They had no water for the horses. They had no water for the men. And Jehoram, being the jubilant, happy guy that he was, pretty much felt that God had decided to just hand him over to the king of Moab. He brought us here to turn us over to the king of Moab. So let's continue now in verse 11 as we continue on in this story. So, but Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. 
but now bring me a musician. And it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And I'm going to kind of rabbit trail here a little bit. I love our worship team. I love our worship Did you guys know you had that kind of influence? And I got to tell you, if you didn't feel the hand of God on you today during worship, you need to get right with the Spirit. Because he was moving today in mighty ways. So the hand of God came upon him. And he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, your animals may drink. And in this simple matter, in the sight of the Lord, he will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Just kind of a sideline. You know, yeah, I'll give you the water. That's more, but, you know, little thing, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you Moab. I'll give you Moab. But they had to do something. God's promise was, I'll give you the water, and I'll give you Moab, but you have to do something for me. I mean, here are all these guys, here are all these, these men, they've marched for seven days. Not an easy march. They were hot and they were tired and they were out of water. You know, I don't know how long they've been without water, but it must have been long enough that it seemed to be a pretty desperate situation because Jehoram felt like God had pretty much abandoned him. He was going to turn and hand him over to Moab. And they were already worn out and weary. They were tired and thirsty. And God said that he wanted them to dig ditches. They'd come into this valley, and they had no water, and the prophet tells them, this is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a little crazy to me. I'm willing to bet that it sounded a little bit crazy to those guys that were in that valley, too. Amen? It doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I could just see when the kings came back and they said, okay, this is, this is what we figured out. God wants you to go down here and dig ditches throughout this whole valley. And these guys are going, what? Wait, wait, wait. We just want our containers filled with water. We, we just want a little rain. We don't want to dig ditches. It sounds ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. But I want you to notice something. As we look through these passages of Scripture, I think we see that God's plan for us requires our response. These men may have just wanted to have water. They probably would have even settled for a little rain cloud to come over and, and give them a cool shower for a little while. But God had a plan for them. And it required a response. They had to get busy and they had to dig ditches in the valley. They had to participate. And they had to have the faith that God would provide. We need to hear what God is telling us to do. And then we need to get busy. And I don't mean that we just need to be doing busy work. But we need to be at the work that God wants us to be doing. We need to allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit regardless of how strange it sounds or how difficult it sounds. And then we need to get busy. God's plan for us requires our response. But God's plan also tests our trust in him. His plan will test our faith. In verse 20, it says, Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly... Water came by way of Edom, and the land was filled with water. Did you see that? I mean, when these men did what God told them to do when they were faithful, even though it didn't make sense, when they did something that sounded totally crazy, they were being obedient. 
And when they did this thing, it didn't seem to make sense. They were being obedient, and God supplied them with more than they even wanted. More than what they needed. He filled the ditches with water. And he did it through his supernatural power. They did something crazy. And God responded miraculously. Now, if these men had decided to go with the whim and say, this is ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. It's nonsense. If they, if they decided that, that if they didn't need to spend the time to dig these ditches, do you think God would have provided the water? I don't think so. Because he told them that if they would dig the ditches, he would fill them with water. And when they were obedient, that's exactly what he did. It's exactly what he did. Now, I understand that it's, it's hard for us to put that kind of trust in God. It's, it's hard to have that kind of faith. And we may believe that he will supply our needs. It says that he will supply all our needs. And we believe he'll do that, but it's difficult for us to believe in the way that he will do it doesn't make sense. It, 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 it goes against everything that's naturally ingrained in our brains. It, it, it goes against what we know, the laws of nature. If he told us to dig a ditch today, would we do it? Is he asking you to dig a ditch today? And it's not just us. I mean, the Bible is just full of stories. And I'm sure that people have always wondered about doing something that they thought was pointless. Remember Joshua? I mean, here he had his army, and he had Israel following him, and, 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 and they came to Jericho, and, and they're ready to go to battle, and they're ready to, to take the city. And God says, okay, I want you to march out of the camp. And I want you to march one time around the city and come back to camp. And, and then the next day, I want you to go march out to the city and march around the city and come back to the camp. And he asked them to do this six days in a row. These are soldiers. They're trained for battle. They're ready to fight. And he's telling me to go for a walk. It doesn't make sense. It's crazy. And then God says, but on the seventh day, I want you to walk up to the city, and I want you to go around seven times. Okay, now this is getting even crazier. Seven times. He said, but at the end of the seventh time, I want the priests to turn towards the wall, and, and I want them to blast on their, their ram's horns as loud as they can, and I want the people to face the wall, and I want them to yell as loud as they can. Okay? They're a little crazy. But they were obedient. And Joshua was obedient. And God brought those walls down. And they took the city. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? I mean, if we didn't already know the outcome, that wouldn't make sense to us. It really wouldn't. And I'm sure that most of the people there, it didn't make sense to them either. But still they were obedient. Still, they did what God asked them to do. And by his supernatural power, he caused the walls to collapse. You know, God told Moses, stretch out your staff out before the waters of the Red Sea. I mean, here they were with their back to the wall, the desert this way, and Pharaoh's army coming, and the water this way, and they're trapped and they believe that, that, that their end is coming, and God says, just hold your staff out. Okay. He was obedient. He was faithful. And God, through his miraculous power, parted the water. And Israel went through. In the desert, God told Moses, he said, take your stick and strike this rock, and water will flow. Not a sign of water anywhere. And I'm going to hit this rock with a stick. 
and water's going to flow. Doesn't make sense, but okay. And he was obedient. And God provided the water they needed. Time after time in the Bible, God told people to do something that just kind of sounded like it would be irrational as far as we understand. And he performed mighty miracles because the people were willing to do what didn't make sense. They were willing to step out in faith. The supernatural power of God, we don't understand it. It goes against everything that we do understand. It goes against, like I said, the laws of nature. Guess what? He wrote the laws. He wrote the laws. But that's how we know that it's God. That's how we know that it's, it's, it's in God's control as he does the miraculous when it doesn't make sense. If we're just obedient. His plan tests our trust. And the third point is that God's plan will always exceed our expectations. In verse 21 through 24, in 2 Kings chapter 3, it says, And when all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to bear arms and older were gathered, and they stood at the border. Then they rose up early in the morning, and the sun was shining on the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings have surely struck swords and have killed one another. Now, therefore, Moab, to the spoil. So when they came to the camp of Israel, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites so that they fled before them, and they entered their land, killing the Moabites. What did the kings want? What did they want God to give them? Water. They wanted water. God gave them water. He gave them all the water they needed and then some. And then he used that water to confuse the Moabites. You see, the Moabites knew that there was no water in that valley. And they thought that the kings had finally lost their minds due to the, the thirst and the hunger and despair and that they had finally decided to fight each other and wiped each other out. And then they ran in to just get the spoils and to gather the plunder. But they had another surprise coming. You see, God had confused them. God made the sun to reflect off of the water just right so the Moabites thought that the valley had been filled with blood. God had handed the battle over to the three kings. God had allowed the Moabites to be defeated with very little effort on their part. And the hardest thing that this army had to do was dig ditches. They had to trust in God. And they had to know that he would provide. So in faith, they dug those ditches, and you know what? God took care of the rest. They wanted water. But they got water and victory. God's power will exceed our expectations. You know, I continually pray and, and seek the Spirit and God, and, and, and I pray that someday I will get to the point where I realize every time he's asking me to do something, he may be asking me to do it in his power, not mine. And all I need to do is be obedient, trust God, and he'll provide. You know, we pray for God's provision all the time. Maybe you're praying for something that has to do with your marriage or Maybe it's your finances. Or maybe you've been asking God to intervene with a child or a sibling that's walked away. 
But when we ask in prayer, do we pray with the expectation that God will provide? Do we pray with the expectation that God miraculously will do his thing? We need to expect that God will do more than provide our needs abundantly more. When we're obedient, he'll exceed our expectations. God's plan for us requires our response. We need to get busy and, and do what God's asking to do, even if it does sound a little crazy to us. Because if it sounds crazy to us, those who are not believers, it's really going to be wacky. It's going to blow them away. And when we act in obedience and we trust God, he gets the glory. God's plan for us requires our response and it tests our trust in him. We need to rely on God's supernatural power. We can't do it alone. But God can do it. With him, nothing is impossible. No matter how crazy it seems. Third, God, his plan will exceed our expectations. He wants us to give more than we're asking for. Today, I want to ask you, my friends, are you willing to do something for God even if it doesn't make sense? Even if it seems a little crazy, are you willing to say, yes, God, I am here. I am available. I'm willing to be obedient. I'm willing to trust in you, God, and I expect that you will show up in mighty ways. That's what these people in the Bible did. Time and time again, we see it over and over and over. It seems a little crazy that Abraham left his home and, and headed out not knowing where he was going. But trusting God knew what he was doing, and you know what? God made him the father of many nations. It seems a little crazy that Abraham went to sacrifice his son Isaac knowing that he was the promise from God. But in his obedience, God provided seems crazy that Joshua honored the call of God even though the people thought he was probably nuts and the walls came down we're saying about the reckless love of God today and it, it just doesn't make sense to us what Jesus did why did he give up heaven why did he give up everything to come to this world to save a bunch of people who were lost. It seems a little crazy when you read the stories about the disciples, how when Jesus called them, they dropped everything and just followed him. And they, they didn't know who he was. They didn't know where he was going. They didn't know what was going to happen. But they were obedient. And they changed the world. All of these things, all these people, they had to do things that made no sense to them at the time. They didn't know what the outcome would be, but they were obedient, and God worked miracles. And I feel that if we're willing to go and dig that ditch, we'll see God work more in our lives and in our church than we have ever seen before. I encourage you today to be willing to do whatever the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do, even when it seems a little crazy. The Holy Spirit guides us every day, but we refuse to be obedient because we just don't understand. And that's where faith comes in. We don't have to understand, folks. We just need to be obedient. God will work out the details. So let's be willing today 
Let's be ready to dig that ditch. And then watch what God's going to do. It'll blow us away. If you're here today and, and, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have your own ditch to dig. The Spirit is calling on your heart. He's prompting you. He's begging you to come forward to accept the salvation that I offer freely to you. If you've never accepted Christ into your life, now is the time. It's really very simple. All you need to do is confess, I need you, Jesus. I'm a sinner. And then ask him into your heart and into your life. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 17, says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ who passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, when, when you started speaking into my heart earlier in the week and putting that word crazy into my heart and in my mind, I didn't understand, Lord. It didn't make a lot of sense. But Father, I trust you. And Lord, I just pray that today that we will be willing to go out and dig that ditch, even though it doesn't make sense. Father, that we would step out in faith. Lord, your plan says, I need you to do something. Your plan of salvation says, I am doing this freely for you, and all you have to do is accept it, but you have to accept it. We thank you for that, Jesus. I thank you for this church that's, that's willing to hear the call of the Holy Spirit on the church and, and willing to look into the future and say, yes, we're going to do this. And we're going to trust you, God, that you're going to provide. And Lord, we're just waiting in great anticipation to see the miracles that you're going to work through our obedience. And Father, I pray for those who are seeking you. Lord, that your spirit would move in their heart, Father, that they would find the love that you give to them, the, the promise of eternal salvation, Lord, and that they would respond. And that we would step out in faith. And Lord, we just thank you for what you will provide. Because I know it's going to blow us away. Father, we just love you and we praise you in Jesus' name.